people are not expecting you to be perfect, you're still expecting yourself to be perfect. And I feel like you'd be more detriment to yourself. Like football players really do not talk about mental health. You know, it's like a sign of weakness. Welcome to Vet Life Reimagined. Get into the mind of today's veterinary students with our guest, Stardis Hutcherson, a third year veterinary student at my alma mater, Auburn University. Stardis's journey from a college football player to veterinary school is incredible. Stardis shows a lot of wisdom as he explains how the strenuous work as a college football player has helped him in his new challenges as a veterinary student. In both areas, he has and is demonstrating leadership and mentorship. We talk about mental well-being in veterinary school, a stronger together mindset, working with your classmates, building those relationships, and we talk about diversity in veterinary medicine and some of the new programs at Auburn that address this. Programs that are attracting big names in the veterinary industry like TV veterinarians, Dr. Terrence Ferguson and Dr. Bernard Hodges from Critter Fixers. I think you will take a lot away from this episode. So let's get to the conversation with future Dr. Stardis Hutcherson. I love names. I like looking at meanings of names, but I also like the story behind names. So can you share how you got your first name Stardis? Because I think that's a very unique name. Oh yeah, I'll be my pleasure to. Um, so it's a family name and um, my dad used to tell me a story that back in the day, so obviously one thing about American history is slavery, right? And uh, my uh, great, 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 great grandfather on my uh, dad's side, he was a slave. And um, he actually was one of the few ones that actually were able to escape to the north because they were in the south. And he escaped to the north and he had to change his name. So he actually created the name of Start Us. So if you think about it, it's two words combined, Start and then us, like it's starting a family. So start and us. So start us. And then kept the last name's Hutcherson. And then it kind of went from there. And then my grandfather was the name one. The next person obviously had start us, and then my dad, then myself. My dad's <laughs> middle name is Almanzo. My middle name is Almanzo, but my grandfather's name is not Almanzo. So although we're all basically the same, the only thing that's different is our middle names. And so that's why I'm the second, because my dad was the first, I guess, Almanzo middle name. That was the second Almanzo. So I'm Stars Almanzo Hutchinson the second. And yeah, so very unique. And that's the story behind it. So. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad I asked. And so my father is a third. Yep. I, I do understand the multiple names and generations, but very cool story. Thank you for sharing that. That's really that interesting. Cool. And kind of speaking of origins, uh, you know, really the first question I tend to ask people is, when did you know that you wanted to get into veterinary medicine? So when did you know? Since I was little, I always wanted to be a vet, I would say. So I know that's like a very common type of like origin story for many vets. I was four year old and I remember that I've always liked animals, always watch all the um, Animal shows on Animal Planet. I love any movie with animals. Lion King is my favorite movie growing up and things of that nature. And I've always been like obsessed with animals to the point where my mom got, you know, tired of me talking about it. So she got me a dog. Um, and her name was Casey. She was a little Shih Tzu dog. And I was just the most interested in her like 24 7. We'd be playing all the time, like a little bit of a doctor in a way, because I know she would take her to the vet and I would go with her and always be interested to go to the vet and see how they would do things there. And then I also got me a parakeet, too. So I had a dog and a parakeet. And the parakeet, I named her Tweety because I also liked the Looney Tunes growing up, too. So Tweety was a parakeet's name. Basically, from then on, I've always been interested in veterinary medicine. I always said I wanted to be a vet. Um, I never had any vets in the family or anything like that. So I had no, like, outside influence. I just kind of just saw it on Animal Planet. I thought, okay, I want to figure out, you know, like, yeah, my mom always said, you know, be in the STEM field type deal. Science, technology, engineering, math. And then, of course, math and also medicine. So I was like, okay, so I want to be a doctor. And I was like, okay, I like animals. So I was like, okay, veterinarian. It's a perfect fit. So that was kind of what I told myself when I was growing up. And then uh, as I got older and around the high school, you know, a big component of veterinary medicine and applying is like getting your volunteer hours. So I started to apply for clinics and start seeing if I can volunteer and get into some of these places. And that's where in um, Mobile, Alabama and uh, the Baldwin County area, First place I actually worked at was Rim Animal Clinic. And I know the Rims are a very big, like, family at Auburn. So that's another reason why I know about Auburn Veterinary Med so much because they're the Rims. And also another reason why I'm here, too, because they basically praise Auburn so much. And uh, it's a great school. 
But at the same time, I was far volunteer at their clinics. And that honestly was what really made me realize this was something I wanted to do. Because you can say it like your whole entire life, X, Y, and Z, but until you actually, you know, get to experience it, that's how you really know if that's something you want to do or not. So that was like my first experience with like veterinary medicine. My junior year of high school summer working and volunteering, even though I was in the kennels, basically, you know, cleaning up, you know, poop and, you know, doing the, you know, the grunt work. But every once in a while, go into the actual hospital tech area and get to see surgeries, and things like that, and talk to them. And they were always so loving and kind and just helpful people. And they knew I wanted to be a veterinarian. And they kind of just ushered me in and brought me into that type of family. And so I guess in a way, that's kind of like my origin story. I don't really have any like big, like there was a, you know, dog I saw wanted to help and you know boom by being by the boom but I think it was just a gradual progression just for interest from a young age and then as that interest grew as I grew I got more and more involved in it and I said okay this is definitely something I want to do for the rest of my life so yeah yeah so were you the only pre-vet football player I'm curious so <laughs> I actually wasn't I was the only person interested in veterinary medicine in my class but the class below us, so um, there was one more guy who also interested in veterinary medicine. And I became his quote unquote mentor because they knew I was interested in veterinary medicine. So they had like a little bit, like a big brother program in the football team at Morehead. And um, I became his mentor because of that. And so we would talk about things, you know, he would go to classes. I tried helping in classes. And unfortunately, he ended up switching his major. Because it's just, it's just those entry level classes, undergrad, that everybody does like like bio one on one, chemistry one on one, where it's like they're trying to weed people out and tried to help them, you know, best I could, but he just changed majors because of those courses. And he still like obviously loves animals, things of that nature, but I feel like that's one of the things that kind of like weaned him away from that, unfortunately. After that, then I definitely was the only person on the football team that was interested in veterinary medicine. So yeah, kind of like a little solo lone wolf type of thing, but it all worked out. I uh, I was definitely good friends with a lot of the teammates. A lot of my teammates want to be like, you know, human doctors because we had the exact same classes. So we always studied yep. together. Yeah. yeah. I went to a, a smaller undergrad school. So I was one of the very few who were pre-vet. They didn't even have technically a pre-vet program. They just kind of grouped us in with pre-med. So I definitely get that. And a lot of those classes with them. But you kind of pointed out that, doing football is very demanding physically and of your time. And then, you know, having a, a pre-vet program is also really demanding. So what did you do to kind of keep up with both aspects? Uh, I ask myself that question every day because <laughs> I look back at it, it's like, man, that was a lot. But first, I give thanks to God for keeping me grounded throughout that time. And besides, it just took a uh, a lot of, I guess, perseverance and mental and physical endurance because there'd be days where, you know, after practice, well, actually, I'll give you a rundown of how the day would go. So we'll have, and this would be during the season, so during the football season, Tuesday would be like the beginning of our work week. We'll start preparing for the game on Saturday. Um, we have meetings starting at roughly around 2 o'clock. And then you'll have practice at four and then from four to like six or seven, you get done. And then you have made treatments, things like that. And then not to mention the next morning, you may have like a 5 a.m. workout. And then if you have to go to the physical therapy for like a nagging injury, because one thing about football is that they, they would say things like if you aren't injured, you're playing. Right. So if you even have a little ache or soreness, you better see you better make sure that you're in the treatment room getting that you know, situated because you're not going to say oh, I can't play or I can't practice today because I have a little sore you know hip or sore thigh well you should have been in the treatment room at six or seven o'clock in the morning before classes getting that looked at so you have that in the morning plus like i said the workout and then you just do the same thing over again two o'clock meetings and then around like seven o'clock you're done and then on top you have to look at film by yourself like yeah you look at film as a team for the opponent but then the coach also um, looks at logs of who is looking at film on their own because that's like your own studying and on top, you have to study for your classes as well, too. So I would sometimes find myself, because of studying for, like, football for the game and then also classes, like, not being done until, like, 10 o'clock. I'm, you know, being up in morning, like, at 5 sometimes. So it would be, like, a long day. And then, of course, you have the game 
in the game. We would, if we're traveling, that's leaving out Friday morning, get to the hotel, you know, Friday, uh, mid afternoon, evening, um, relaxing, eating dinner, doing team meetings at the hotel. Then the next day on Saturday, getting ready for the game at one o'clock, or if it's a late game at seven, and then traveling, coming back home, being back home by Sunday, and then having an off day on Monday. That's our one off day of the whole week, and then doing it again on Tuesday. And on top of that, you have tests and things of like that throughout the week. So it was a lot of juggling. Um, and that's why I just keep on saying I thank God for keeping me grounded during all that. Because I knew what I wanted to do. I knew it was going to be hard. But it's something I was really passionate about. I think the passion also is what kind of like driven and was able to keep me also afloat, um, too. Because I, I wanted to play football at this level, the highest level I could. And at the same time, I wanted to go to veterinary school. Those two... I sometimes would conflict with each other, but at the same time, they both someone want to do. So I just had to like, I don't like saying, put down your head and grind because I know today we're more focused on mental health and it can be, I'm be honest, there are some days where mental health was at play where I was just so exhausted. I didn't want to do one or the other type deal. And looking back at it, I wish I was more cognizant of my mental health now that I've like mature and grown. I look back and say, okay, maybe I shouldn't have got or done that, or maybe I shouldn't have stayed up that late. I could have, you know, had some, you know, mediation here and there. That's what you say you hindsight twenty twenty you learn from a type deal. But at the same time, just going through that was a lot of like, you know, putting your nose to the the grindstone, just kind of grinding away. Now I'm more like, okay, well, mental health wise, it's not the best thing to do. You gotta have days where you can chill but also take a breather and relax and really focus on yourself which i didn't do a lot of that in undergrad which ironically because veterinary school is in a whole nerd ballpark and honestly it's a lot more harder than undergrad even with football i'm realizing that but i'm more cognizant of my mental health days and my mental health in vet school than i am in undergrad which is kind of ironic but yeah i feel like i kind of well tangent a little bit there to them but i hope that kind of answers the question no that that's fantastic. I think the the reason why, you know, one, I'm interested, but two, just to keep going down that path is because that is a, a big thing in vet school is the the mental load, the the load of work that you're doing while you're in vet school. And I'm glad you kind of were reading my mind. I was like, well, maybe this prepped him for <laughs> uh, vet school. And, and you even commented that, wow, this actually might be even a little, little harder. And because you were able to experience that in undergrad, you kind of had that hindsight, you could say, oh, wow, I, I might do this slightly differently. And it sounds like you're implementing some of those things as you go through vet school. And one of the things you said you were interested in talking about was actually the mental health and well-being of your veterinary student colleagues. So, I mean, we're, we're here now. So what are your thoughts on now being able to do that hindsight and from undergrad and, and you're going through it, you're going, you're about to start your fourth year soon. What are you kind of seeing when it comes to mental well-being with the veterinary students? And what are some pieces of advice that you would give? I would say for like Auburn uh, specifically, I do believe like our university, like our college does a good job of like understanding that we are stressed all the time and our professors are so understanding of that because i mean they were veterinary students probably in the same chairs not too long ago or even in green hall not too long ago grinding away at the information and not that we're learning right now so they understand where we're at and understand that okay this is hard stuff and they're very empathetic and they understand that by you know helping as much as they can and i do believe auburn does believe in mental health they have a lot of different opportunities like a lot of different uh, services available to us they have well the uh, wellness blocks where they literally give us time in our day just to be away from school to take care of errands or just to just sit there and just recollect yourself. So I do believe mental health is a very big priority at Auburn, and I really am appreciative of that. But even with all the resources, um, sometimes things can still get overwhelming, and sometimes you have to be that person to be like, okay, I have to use these resources too. Because even though they're there, you got to use them to get the help that you need. And I'm not going to lie. At one point, I was like that, where I wouldn't use the resources as much, specifically our counseling services. And I think this is now going back to the football mindset. One thing I will say I struggled with coming to veterinary school was going from being an athlete um, with a team and also with the expectations of being the best that you can be at all times 
and to veterinary school where that's still like my what was my expectation but at the same time whenever they'll get to moments where i realize that i'm not my best today then i would kind of have these like little slumps in my i guess demeanor or mood because i'm not perfect today and i should be perfect because i was used to that for the last for all my undergrad basically because college coaches you have you have your good ones you have your bad ones and they always it's like you know how they say like a high turnover rate for coaches i feel like college coach football coaches is a high turnover rate for that i feel like every program deals with that where you may have one year you have one coaching staff the next literally the next year you have a completely new one except for maybe the head coach and maybe defensive coordinator or the head coach too like it's just a lot of turnover so you get a lot of different mindsets and a lot of different people one year i had a coach that was a player's coach loved him best coach I ever had in my life the next year i had a coach I'm not going to use explicitives or anything like that, but I really did not like his personality. I wish the best for everybody. I hope he's doing well, but he was just not the best person in terms of like caring about your as his, caring about his players. At the same time, when you leave, when you're used to that so much, you know, when you get to an environment where that's not the case, like you said, that level, even though people are not expecting you to be perfect, you're still expecting yourself to be perfect. And I feel like you'd be more detriment to yourself. So going back to vet school, I came here first year, second year. I definitely had that perfectionism. It was a little bit higher than it is now. I still believe in doing the best I can and striving for perfection, but it's definitely not as bad as it used to be first and second year. And it got to a point where I just drained myself out completely mentally. And I would never want to go to counseling services because another thing about football is if you feel like, you're experiencing some sort of mental issue you know it's like a sign of weakness like football players really do not talk about mental health never was ever mentioned in our locker room if you are quote unquote, they and they i'm not going to say the words they would say but if you are like having a bad day because a class or a friend or a girlfriend or anything like that and it affects you on a practice field you know they tell you to you know basically just to suck it up get over it you know play through a type deal and if you don't, you know, maybe cuss you out, make you feel less than yourself. Um, sometimes even teammates can do that, too. And it just makes you even feel worse. And I feel like now, as I'm talking to some of my teammates now after football and even some of my other friends that went to other colleges playing the SEC, which I've heard is even even worse than SEC. You know, Auburn, we love SEC football, but it's, it's, a, it's a different ballpark with those coach, some of the coaches. I do believe Hugh Freeze is a good players coach, though. I do like Hugh Freeze. But um, yeah, and mental health is just not a big component. And it's starting to get talked about more in the football world, but um, it's just not a big component. So when I came to veterinary school, that definitely was like, I don't want to talk to a counselor because I can get through this myself. I don't need someone to help me. I can do it myself. And that was just that football mindset. But then I realized, okay, I need to talk to someone eventually. It got to that point, basically second year. Um, and since then, I've been doing well. And in terms of my classmates, because I'm not the only person in my class that probably had that perfectionist mindset and things of that nature. Um, some of my friends definitely had that same mindset too. And I feel like as we went through veterinary school, um, now we're third years, it's like that has lessened in us and that we're more just focused on, okay, we're here to get this education, but at the same time, we're not here to kill ourselves. You know, we're here to, you know, get through, yeah, we gotta, we gotta survive first. So we get to that, you know, graduation and then become doctors, you know, we don't need to, you don't need to stress ourselves to death. And I believe that right now, that's kind of the mindset of my class, particularly, is that, you know, hey, we're, we're third years. We got finals. We're really, really in finals right now. And then mini semester and we go to clinics. And then we just got to get through and work together. Let's help each other out. And I believe my class really believes in like, you know, hey, let's help each other out. Let's not bicker. Let's just get through this together type deal. And let's finish this together, which I feel like is a really good thing about our class. Um and I feel like the first years, second years, and fourth years, I'm going to talk about the younger classes first, first and second year. Fourth years are kind of like they're already in class. They're about to graduate. They only got a couple more months and they get pre tutorship So they're also that same mindset. So let's get together. Let's get this done. Let's go be doctors type deal. But I feel like the first year and second years, because those years are one year is you're adjusting to veterinary school the first year. Second year is you're getting like hammered by all the tests and classes, two tests every week. It's just constant, constant going. So I do feel like their mental health are their mental health particular is definitely more uh, things attacking it for those two classes. And I do have some I have a second year mentee. I have some first years I know I try to talk to him, encourage him as much as I can. 
because I like so once again, I was in that same position, letting them know, hey, it's gonna be okay. And don't try to be a perfectionist. Don't get too down on yourself. If you were used to maintain A's in undergrad and you're starting to get B's, maybe some C's now. The thing is though, just find out what you did wrong, do better. But at the same time, don't let that, you know, stress you to the point where you're just draining yourself. Cause I, at that point, you kind of like you shooting yourself in the foot in a way too. And um, I don't want you to burn out because it's very easy to happen. It can happen to anybody. And they just don't want to see it happen to anybody here, you know, or anywhere, anywhere across the country it comes to veterinary medicine. But especially here, because this is like our family, this is our family unit, you know, you're definitely going to be more intentional people in your intermediate family unit. You still love your friends and your, you know, um, extended family, but that intermediate family, unit, you're going to want to try to keep that, you know, as good as you can. So, yeah, but in terms of mental health here, I do think we have good resources. We just got to, you know, convince people to use those resources and to definitely bond together as a class, which I know takes time. But once the, each class does that, I think that can also be a big benefit as well, too. I love listening to how you describe this situation because I like the sports analogy. Coming in with this perfectionist mindset, you kind of referred it back to a football mindset, but that is a very, very common thing for for students coming into vet school because it's a competitive place. You have worked so hard to get into that seat in vet school, get as good a grades as possible, because I know that's a, a key point to getting into vet school. You have a room full of those individuals. The one thing I do hope to bring you know, it, it, from your sports analogy into that environment is the team mindset in that we're not fighting against each other. We're done with the competition. Like we're, we're in, we're here. We are now a team and we work together through these four years. It is a small profession. It is a lot about relationships and who you know. So start young. You got to get through this together. And you're right. You've you've got to start to, and I know it's easier said than done. I've gone through it too. You kind of have to start shedding that perfectionist mindset. Yes, you do your best. You learn, you're, you're there, you're excited to get this education and to become doctors. But I promise there will not be a client who asked you, what were your grades? So <laughs> you're fine. Maybe you can make that a, a keynote speech one day is pulling in your, your football analogy. But I think that is, that's really important. Be a team, work together. I'm so glad that you're, you're using your resources. You're mentoring others as well. Not a lot of people probably think about that to do that. So thank you so much for that. Speaking of mentoring, you participated in a really neat program that Auburn does, and it's called the Summer Veterinary Intensive Program. And you did that with a couple other veterinarians who came in and, and were part of this program. Do you mind sharing a little bit more about it? Because I don't remember it when I was there. So I think this is maybe a newer program, but it sounds fantastic. So can you talk to that a, a little bit and what you what you like about it? Oh, yeah, definitely. I would love to elaborate on it. So the uh, summer veterinary intensive program we call it the VIP. And it's a it's a brand new program. Only had been two, I guess you want to say, years of it running. First year was in uh, 2022, and it was uh, actually brought to the dean by uh, one of our former graduates class of uh, 2020. Yeah, 2022. Um, India Woods, or now Dr. India Woods. She has like a she's a figs ambassador. She works at Sci Fair. She really amazing person. She's awesome. And uh, she brought it to the dean and said, hey, like, I would like to have this program. Before I graduate, I'd like to, you know, put on something that I can have at Auburn that can help mentor basically the future generation of veterinary students and give them the full look of what it takes, you know, get into veterinary school, but also what it's like to be in veterinary school, more of a like behind the scenes type of thing, and also to promote diversity within the veterinary field. The dean loved it. They worked together on it. They put, you know, worked on this while she was in her clinical year, which is also like crazy. Like she started it and she did all the planning of it during her, you know, fourth year clinical year. So she was like going like in between clinics, tired, stressed out, and also planning this major program that's like a, a week of activities for, you know, nine students at the time, field trips and everything. 
um, working with um, the Office of Academic Affairs, you know, Dean, Dr. Camus, Assistant Dean, and also Dr. Sellers, Director of Administration, um, and just putting on this amazing program while in our clinical year. And I was like, wow, that's impressive. Just by, and by herself, too, because she was the one that brought it to the table, too. So there was no other students helping her. It was just her and the Office of Academic Affairs. Whenever she got the program basically, you know, finished and finalized, she asked um, me and another student to be student counselors. The other student name is uh, Sean Lynn. She's a, now she's in her fourth year um, clinical rotations and now I'm in third year, but we were the first two counselors for that. And we had these nine students come that were all undergrad students um, that were interested in veterinary medicine from different universities across Alabama. And we basically had a whole week for them where each day they would be, you know, they come to the school, we actually pay for their, you know, food and their housing, gave them basically rooms at the hotel at Auburn. Like we basically gave them the whole red carpet treatment and we got them to experience anatomy lab, um, histology lab, got them in the actual hospital, small animal teaching hospital, large animal hospital, get them experience working with horses, cows, um, see small animal ophthalmology, see uh, primary clinical practice, radiology. And just the whole gambit, whatever we could, you know, fit in that whole week for them. It was like a full day from like seven to five every day for them. Um, but they loved every second of it. And then we also had a field trip to um, see the critter fixers, Dr. Hodges, Dr. Ferguson, and uh, Bonaire, Georgia. They have their you know TV show on uh, Disney Plus and um, Nat Geo Wild. And it was like, wow, this is like my first time, quote unquote, meeting a celebrity. So I was actually like giddy. I was like, oh, my gosh, like I'm about to talk. And then we went to the clinic. You could just see like the whole atmosphere was just busy, bustling. Like if you ever watched a TV show, it, like how they are on the TV show is just how they are in person. The same energy, the same motivation. Um, and then literally everybody there is nice and friendly and the students loved it. Um, they got to experience a lot of different things there. After that, we got a lot of um, positive, I guess you want to say kudos from people around the university. Like I said, Andy did a great job first year. and. Now she's working in SciFair in Houston. And then the second year, I was asked to be the quote unquote, I guess you'll say student uh, coordinator for the, the program. So now it's my turn to you know, coordinate the week, to call the clinicians and say, hey, let's get together, see what you know we can do for this week for the students and put all the schedule together and then you know put on interviews for the students, make an application for the students and so they can sign up and go through the whole gambit of everything that basically Andy had to do, but in my second year, and I'm like, it was, it was busy. And I can see like, whenever India said she did her fourth year clinical year, I'm like, man, this is true. I'm, I'm sure this is, it was on my second year. Now second year is nothing to sneeze at, but I think clinics would be a little bit more challenging the second year. So I get like say India, all the credit for that, but I did the second year for it. And we just had it, like I said, in May and we had, we actually upgraded from nine students to 10 students. So we had one more actual space and we actually opened up to our Kentucky pool. So it was now all Alabama residents and also Kentucky residents because of the actual contract we have with Kentucky with Auburn University. Um, and so we had a good pool of students from both of those two um, pools and had a great week. And this year we actually included the Georgia Aquarium visit in there as well too. We actually met a vet, his name is Dr. Um, Gregory Scott. He actually works with Dr. Camus's husband, who works at UGA, that does all the pathology for the Georgia Aquarium. So he like, if there's a whale shark that died or something, he will cut open and see it and examine it. And I'm like, I'm not into pathology, but I'm not gonna like to see inside a whale shark and see how big they are like that. That's pretty cool. So that's how we met Dr. Gregory Scott and got that contact. And me and him would meet and we would talk about what you know we like the students to experience at the Georgia Aquarium. And we went there and they got a behind the scenes tour of the vet facilities. Um, they got to see a lot of animal encounters, got to see veterinary uh, specific animal encounters too, like ultrasounding a stingray, uh, see a, a penguin exam, uh, just physical exam, and also see a beluga whale experience for them as well too. We also went to the credit first again this year and they got to do a lot of things there too. So they had a full, basically packed week once again, and they all loved it. I enjoy being the student coordinator and putting it on and just, you know, going through the whole process from planning the very beginning stages in October of last year and then seeing the product in May. I also had two students that are, one is my mentee, he's a second year, that'd be a student counselor, and then one of my um, current uh, classmates 
also very involved in the school and she wanted to have the opportunity to help these you know kids develop and things like that also be a student counselor then we also had um, a former auburn grad in 92 or 93 dr david knox he also came and he also helped that week too so we had a lot of support this year and we actually have a lot more support next year as well too because like each year people more and more want to be involved with the program and so and also i'm putting on the program again this year too and then hopefully the application should be going live soon so if anyone that is a pre-vet student is watching this you want to come to vip and you're alabama resident or protected resident just look on our website we do have the application going live very soon so and please apply perfect timing we'll, yeah. we'll advertise for you <laughs> yeah <laughs> That is so cool. One, like the Georgia Aquarium is one of my favorite aquariums. So, I mean, all sorts of animals that they can look at. So that's a really cool experience as well. And what a neat idea. I think, you know, I've had quite a few conversations talking about how can we be better at encouraging a more diverse and inclusive admission into vet school. And I think that's a great opportunity to encourage these undergrads, give them a program, get them not only familiar with vet med to maybe encourage them to keep going, but also maybe to better understand or meet the the professors at the veterinary school so that they meet them, they know them, and Maybe, hopefully that would be helpful in the interview process or something like that. So just any anything that can slightly change our strategy where we can improve our diversity. And I know that's an important topic to you as well that you're interested in talking about. So this program is a great example, but what other things have you thought about when it comes to this in, in veterinary medicine? So I guess in terms of like diversity as a whole in veterinary medicine, Obviously, we're not the most diverse profession in the world. It's definitely something I like to see change. And I believe diversity, although being like a moral and like ethical like thing to like strive for, I think it's also a very logistically and objective thing in terms of like increasing the value of the profession. Like people with different like backgrounds, different experiences from different groups of people coming together to form a better cohesive profession can definitely improve the profession as a whole just in general i think that's just diversity in a way just improves things in general in my opinion and just different mindsets can help solve problems that wasn't have been thought in a certain light before so, but yet to have those people in those spaces to have those different perspectives at certain issues and certain issues especially affecting the veterinary field you never know there may be in a veterinary einstein that could be from you know the black community, the Asian community, white community, doesn't really matter. But we have to have those people in those space in these spaces to have those type of problem solving skills. But going on how I guess I think of ways to kind of prove like the VIP program is one way to give students that didn't have that same exposure growing up to veterinary medicine. It's like, hey, this is a potential career path for you too. Um, there's more than just like, yeah, you have human medicine, you have lawyers, you have all these other different professions that are, I'll be honest, are kind of more highly top, like talked about. And I'm going to talk from experience of being a black man, basically. One thing I mentioned about my mom saying the STEM field, she didn't say veterinarian, she said doctor, like human doctor. And I actually got talked like, now when I said I want to be a veterinarian, she's like, well, you know, human doctors make more and, you know, you make a lot more money being a human doctor. I'm like, and you, you're smart enough to be a human doctor. I was like, yeah, I know I could be a human doctor if I want to, but I have a passion for this. I want to go to veterinary medicine, you know? And then a lot of my family members, and I go to church, things like that, and I tell them, yeah, I'm in veterinary school and things like that. They say, oh, well, you're doing a good thing. There's not a lot of black veterinarians. They haven't seen themselves as a black veterinarian before. And I'm like, wow, that's very interesting. And I'm pretty sure you probably say the same in some other communities as well, too. But once again, going to like the black community, I just think it's not something that's very talked about that much in the black community is veterinary medicine. but Recently, I have been seeing things like, for example, the Critter Fixer, Dr. Hodge, Dr. Ferguson having a TV show on national TV, especially on Disney Plus and that G Wild, where people are starting to see the exposure to black veterinarians. And even before them, you had um, the vet life with Dr. Blue, and Dr. Ross at Sci Fair, like just showing that, hey, there are black people in this profession. And then if you want to be a vet, it's possible, you know. And there's other you know, veterinarians that you know have different 
you know, back backgrounds and ethnicities, like uh like we just talked about, you know, Dr. Gherkin, she's South Korean and American. And then one of her best friends, his name is Dr. Ko, they're all working in emergency. He's also has an Asian background. And he talked to us in first year that, you know, a lot of his family members would say things like when he was a veterinarian that they didn't really once again, same thing, didn't have the same representation, prefer a human doctor. And I was like, wow, that's what my mom would tell me a lot. Now my mom accepts me being a veterinarian, but it's just things like that. And I think as we see more representation in the field, we will see more people accepting that, yes, you can be a veterinarian. It's there for you. And there is also no like fear of also pursuing a profession to say like, oh, well, maybe there's not many people that look like me in the profession. And I just don't want that to be something to hold someone back pursuing too. Because I've also talked to some of my colleagues and things like that. And there was this one person I actually met um, actually at an Auburn football game just recently. And she's a senior now. And she was pre-veterinarian. And it was kind of ironic that we were right. Like it was actually me, my mentee, which is second year name is Jeff. And then his mentee, which is first year name is Colin. We're all there have a good time to game and she was right beside us just staying and watching and we were just talking to her she said that she wanted to be a vet but she thought it was like she thought it was like too hard and things of that nature and also she's probably didn't see the same representation and i was like well you have three of us right here beside you and trust me it, it is hard don't get me wrong but we're making it through and you know if you ever change your mind we will encourage you to pursue it type deal so i think that that's very important is having that representation and I guess the ways that I'm trying to improve it from my own, I guess, involvement or things I like to do is, um, like I said, mentorship. There is a pre-veterinary club on the uh, main campus that I'm going to start being more involved with to go and talk to them about things. And they are Black students at um, the main campus. I want to talk to them, give them some invi advice, how to apply, what they need to do. For X, Y, and Z, and also manage, distribute them information about the VIP program so they can apply as well too. But I do believe that mentoring the younger students, just showing them, hey, like you can do this, you're not alone, um, and definitely and just imploring them to pursue that um, would also improve, like I said, diversity and also just in general improve the number of vets that we need in general because there is a shortage of veterinarians in America as well too, and we need more vets and we need to pull from everywhere. You know, you need to pull from everywhere to improve that number as well, too. So, yeah. Quite a few of us probably, no matter what we look like, at some point had someone tell us, are you sure you don't want to be a human doctor? Because <laughs> I, I still remember that as well. So, yes, it, it we are a very unique profession. And I I hope you feel this way, that you're, you're also excited to be here and you know, continue your career in vet med. It is a wonderful profession. There are so many opportunities within it. I think even more so than human medicine, which is kind of neat. You get to be more creative and try different things, I think, to a, a greater degree. So thank you so much. We were almost out of time, but I thought I would ask you a few more questions. We didn't even get to talk about your interest in neurology, but I I am excited for you. I did want to comment though, because I, I read somewhere you said that you're kind of known as the weird neuro guy because you like neurology. <laughs> and I interviewed a, another neurologist and she said the same thing that she was known as the weird neuro, neuro girl. So it's good. It's good to be weird. Join, join us yeah. <laughs> real quickly. You, you started talking about mentorship and that you're a mentor, but you also have quite a few yourself. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to do a shout out to anyone. Is there a particular mentor that you wanted to to talk about? Someone that you admire in it, where you're going through school and anyone yeah. in particular? There's I have quite a bit. Does that have to be just one or just not a fair question? We could be here for a while. <laughs> gotcha. Everyone, okay. thank you for being a mentor, but who's the first that comes <laughs> to your mind? Okay. So I'm gonna first one comes to mind, I guess, at the veterinary school. And he's not a veterinary doctor, um, but it's Dr. Sellers. He's like I said, director of admissions, and me and him worked together on the VIP last year and also working on VIP this year. And I already kind of gave Dr. Gherkin her kudos in the 
the Auburn page that was written about, you know, my journey and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So now it's time to give me kudos, Dr. Sellers. But um, he's definitely been, I think, like, as soon as I got there on campus, he's always been a very supportive person to me. Not saying no one else hasn't, but I just know, like, when it comes down to also being another, you know, he's also another Black man, too, in the exact same space. We definitely relate to a lot of different things. We always joke and cut up, and it's always a good time, basically. He's also very hilarious, and he always knows and can tell whenever I'm not feeling myself. And that's another thing, like, I'm very good about hiding my emotions. And I think that also stems from football again, just kind of like keeping a stone cold face, not letting nothing get to me type deal, or at least appearing as nothing's getting to me. But it's like somehow he can see when something's getting to me. I remember one day I was in class and I was feeling pretty, pretty bad, like very low, kind of honestly depressed. And no one throughout the whole day basically said anything, which I'm not saying that they weren't. And, you know, like they just saw something, they didn't care. It's just like, you know, it, it's vet school. Everybody's got their focus on what's going on. It was also during second year. So everybody's stressed out at the same time. So probably everybody's a little bit depressed. So let's be real. But I just remember Dr. Sellers. I was walking by him. I said hello to him. And I didn't want to talk about anything. I wanted to get home so I can kind of just sit there and just try to work through my emotions. But he's like, hey, what's what's going on? I'm like, oh, I'm fine. And he's like, are you sure? And I'm like, I'm fine. And then he said, are you really sure? And I was like, no. So we went to his office, we talked and he helped me through some things. And it was actually a really good conversation that really boosted my mood. And so when it comes down to like people, like I really high respect, which I respect a lot of people at the university. Dr. Stiller is definitely one that I feel like not a lot of people know too much about him because he, he does a lot for the school, but it's not like it's. Like when it comes around to the classmates, they don't really know too much, but I know what he does and what he does for our class. And I really appreciate the work he does. And uh, I definitely give him a shout out because he deserves it. Thank you for joining us on Vet Life Reimagined. Please make sure that you click the follow button on your podcast app to avoid missing one of our weekly episodes. I have a lot of wonderful episodes coming. If you would like to support this podcast, there are a few other ways that are 100% free. Give it a five-star rating and review, and then subscribe over on the Vet Life Reimagined YouTube channel. We appreciate you and all your support. Until next time.